Well, welcome to uh, the, the second day of this very exciting conference. I've looked at the program. I'm very disappointed that because of other commitments, I'm not able to, to attend many of the sessions because they really do look terrific. Uh, my name's Paul Haywood. I'm Executive Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences here at the University of Nottingham, and it's my very great pleasure to be able to welcome this morning's keynote speaker, who is Professor Ian Boyd. Professor Boyd is a professor in biology at the University of St. Andrews, but he is currently also chief scientific advisor to DEFRA, the UK Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, a position to which he was appointed in 2012 for an initial period of three years. Professor Boyd has been director of the Scottish Oceans Institute at the University of St Andrews and of the Sea Mammal Research Unit, a partner institute of the Natural Environment Research Council from 2001 to 2012. He was responsible for the creation of the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology for Scotland in 2009, a partnership of nine institutions conducting marine science across Scotland. He is a member of the Scottish Science Advisory Council, chairman of a scientific advisory board on decommissioning for oil and gas, and he also chairs the committee that monitors the environmental compliance around Europe's largest oil terminal at Sillam Vaux in Shetland. Much of his career has been spent in polar science. He worked for the British Antarctic Survey from 1987 to 2001, where his interests were focused on the behavioral and physiological ecology of Antarctic seals and the ecology and management of the Southern Ocean. More recently, he was chief scientist for a US Navy study examining the behavioral responses of whales to military sonar. And he was a co-developer of environmental risk management procedures used by the Royal Navy. He served on two inquiries into the future of Scottish fisheries and the implications of common fishery policy reform for the Scottish fishing industry and was a member of the Lenfest Forish Fish Tank Force that recommends a global 50% reduction in the level of fishing for some of the planet's most abundant fish species. Much of his recent research has focused upon the effects of sound on marine life, and this has led to his role as co-chair of the International Quiet Oceans Experiment, a joint initiative of the Scientific Committee for Ocean Research and the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean. Professor Boyd is on the board of reviewing editors of science and is a former editor-in-chief of the Journal of Zoology. He has a, a BSc and a DSc degrees from the University of Aberdeen, a PhD from the University of Cambridge and has received prizes for his research including the Scientific Medal of the Zoological Society of London and the Bruce Medal for Polar Science from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He is also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. As a government advisor and scientist, Professor Boyd represents the science policy interface, that crucial area between knowledge production and policy making that has become so critical and at times so contested in recent years. Professor Boyd will be able to give us an insight into the practice of giving political advice, which involves the management of different roles and expectations. Being a scientist seems to imply that we need to be very careful when making statements about what we know and how much we can know with certainty. Whereas being a policy advisor seems to imply that we are expected to make recommendations for practical implementation. 
I don't know what Professor Boyd is going to say in his talk, but my hope is that we will hear from him about how this tension can be addressed and which of the differing expectations can be managed more or less easily. So please welcome Professor Boyd. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a very, very full introduction. Um, uh, it sometimes um, takes my breath away to think back on a lifetime of doing things. And um, uh, a lot of the things that were mentioned in that introduction, I have actually had to give up because of the conflicts of interest that there are between what I do now and what I used to do in a completely independent role. And I think that tells you something about the kind of role that I have now, uh, which is in a very sensitive area advising ministers about policy. Um, it's something that is, is tough to take sometimes as a, a, a chief scientific advisor that actually your independence to some extent has been, as an ac academic, has been compromised, but that's one of the trade-offs that I want to talk about um, uh, in, this, in this talk over the next 40 or 45 minutes or so. Anyway, I, I believe that you had uh, a, an interesting day yesterday with uh, a, a lot of uh, sparky discussion. Uh, I hope that what I am going to say will help to spark the discussions off uh, in a similar vein for today. Uh, and I, I am grateful for this opportunity to speak. I, I do enjoy talking about my role and particularly the role that chief scientific advisors have uh, in government systems uh, and the interface between science and policy because it is, it is vital. Um, science has a number of different roles in society, uh, some of which are just to invent things and to create new things for people to use and to benefit people's lives. But a very important role is how the knowledge that sits within the scientific community is transmitted to those making some of the most um, important decisions that affect our lives. Um, and as I'll say, I think that sometimes we, sometimes we get that right, but very often we do not do it very well. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, there are lessons to be learned from some of the experiences um, of the past. So I'm going to try and make some important points. Uh, important of these is that uh, the stock of science uh, in decision making is, in my view, declining. Um, and I might go into some of the reasons, I will go into some of the reasons for why I think that. Um, and it's not necessarily the fault of the politicians or the bureaucrats that that is happening. In my view, it's to a very great degree the fault of scientists themselves. Now, I can say that with some authority because I am a scientist, so I'm speaking from that platform. Um, and I think that science has to get better at communicating um, its own ideas. Uh, so I, what I'd like to try to do in this talk is address the dual challenge of providing policy relevant evidence and how we can better communicate that evidence uh, to all the main players and that's uh, uh, politicians, uh, bureaucrats and most importantly all, of all the public. Um, but I think above all and going back to the title of this session what I want to be is an advocate uh, for scientists having a role in calming the waters rather than stirring things up. There's enough other people stirring things up uh, and I think that scientists have a very important role in terms of uh, providing um, uh, uh, the capacity to calm waters. Um, why is science uh, uh, perhaps failing in some of these respects? Well, I think that to summarize, I think we overpromise. I think we underdeliver. Um, and I think that we can become political, mainly with a small p, but sometimes, unfortunately, with a large p. And I think that's where some of the problems uh, tend to arise. Oops. Let's see. There we go. So what I'd like to do in the talk is, is Talk, uh, is, is go through a little bit about what a chief scientific, scientific advisor does uh, in a UK context. Um, 
uh, and that's just to give you a feel for my role. And, and, and I would say that this talk is a very personal perspective on this. So what I'm trying to do is reflect back to you as a group of interested individuals um, what it's like for me in the policy environment and some of the experiences I've had and some of my reflections on that. Um, I would then want to talk a little bit about structures to support exchange of knowledge. Um, because I think structural elements are important to making sure that the exchange of knowledge actually happens in a, a, in a, in a way that is uh, useful to those who are uh, receiving that information, in other words, the receptors. Um, I then want to talk a little bit about trying to understand the audience, in other words, the people who are receiving the information, because I think that sometimes as scientists we probably don't do enough about thinking about that. And then I want to go through some examples, just four examples of the use and misuse of evidence, or where evidence has helped and where it has not helped. Because there are times when science and evidence actually does not help very much. Uh, so I've got two examples of where I think it has been positive, and two where I think it probably hasn't helped an awful lot. And some of those examples are uh, from my sort of portfolio of, of interest at the moment in um, food and environment. So just to look at the role of CSAs, well, um, the UK is, is almost unique, not quite, uh, in having a cadre of chiefs. Um, it's become a bit of a cliche to have a chief for this and a chief for that, and uh, um, I'm one of those chiefs. It's not my choice of name, but it's, it's the choice of name that people seem to like. Um, but we need to get, be sure that the terminology doesn't get in, in the way of the understanding of the function or the roles. Only, I think, the USA, um, New Zealand and Australia have equivalent systems and even they don't have systems that are quite as highly developed as the UK system. So here are some of my colleagues, chief scientific advisors for various departments in the UK and uh, 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 on the, on the, on the left-hand side here, um, Sir Mark Walport, who's the government chief scientific advisor. Um, we might for a moment consider um, that uh, other countries may not have chief scientific advisors, but there may be other reasons for them not having, having those individuals. First of all, they may consider them not to be worthwhile. In other words, they're, they're just not perceived to add value. And, and I think that's a fair, a fair question. Um, they may have advice coming from other routes. Um, and uh, that they may have this advice, but it just doesn't carry the name of a chief scientific advisor. And it may not be a single individual, for example. But in some other countries, they may not be interested in science at all. Um, and if you look at various other countries and ask to what extent is science used in policy, and how does that affect national performance, uh, it would be an interesting academic question to see whether uh, science actually helps or not in terms of um, national performance, depending, uh, I suppose, on how you measure national performance. But I suspect in other countries it's a bit of all of those. There's a bit of a disinterest in some places. There is a lot of interest in others. Uh, they use uh, scientific evidence uh, under different names. And, uh, you know, for, for example, in France and Germany, I'm absolutely certain they're using scientific evidence in the same way uh, as we do, uh, or to the extent that we do. It's just fed into the system in a, a very different sort of way. So what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about some of the lessons that um, I have learned um, as a chief scientific advisor um, in the policy environment. Um, and remember, I just came from an academic background. Okay, I had a background in working with industry, I had a background in working with Ministry of Defence, uh, with uh, various environment and rural affairs departments and things like that. So my history was, although based, based in academic research, it was, a, it was often, not always, but often at the interface uh, between uh, science and decision making. I think the first lesson I would say is that um, uh, government is hard work. 
Um, it's not easy to make some of the decisions that politicians have to make. In business and in academia, we choose the problems that we want to deal with. In business, you don't tackle a problem unless you can make money out of it. In academia, you tend not to tackle a problem unless you think there's some form of solution at the end of the day, or at least it's, it's, it's leading you down an interesting intellectual line. In government, there is no choice. You have to tackle the problems. And some of those problems are intractable. They're wicked problems with no solutions. And I think what we in, in the scientific community need to get more sensitized to the fact that some problems actually can be exacerbated by doing more work on them in, in, from a scientific point of view. In other words, more knowledge is often not the solution to particular problems because actually the problem is deeply embedded in a socio-political system that simply has to work it out in its own ways. Uh, and going out and doing more research is actually sometimes uh, not the way to um, address those particular problems. Um, so, the, on the, on the other, so one of the other um, um, uh, issues that I have certainly experienced is that when I first came into government, I thought, as a scientist, I had a pretty gr good grip on, on reality. In other words, you could do an experiment, you could demonstrate that things happened in a particular way. When it comes to working in the kind of socio-political mix that exists in uh, places like uh, uh, Whitehall and Westminster, um, there are multiple realities running all the time. And different people are, are trying to develop those multiple realities for their own ends. And uh, I, I think that if, if, you're, if you're grounded in the, in the biological or physical sciences, for example, you do have a very strong sense of reality. But when it comes to the social, socio-political um, field, then those realities start to be rather diluted. And uh, um, as a result, it's a bit of an eye-opener for somebody like me who's come from a particular scientific method to walk into a place where actually there are a number of different views running and all have in their own ways uh, potentially equal validity. So I think that we need to uh, 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 realize this and address this as a scientific community uh, and understand, it comes back to understanding the audience that we're speaking to. But there is one golden rule that uh, I would say for anybody who's not just the chief scientific advisor, but anybody who's involved in scientific research, is that you should never become a part of the problem. I have direct experience in my previous um, job of being involved in a major controversy. It was actually in relation to fisheries in the North Pacific, where I was doing research on that. As an academic in the UK, no vested interests at all. But because I was doing that research, I was being hauled into the political controversy around it. Um, and I was actually becoming part of the problem. So I made the decision to stop that research completely and move out of the field and say nothing more about it. Because I was actually making the problem worse by being there and actually developing new ideas and things like that. It was just complicating the issue. Um, I'm not saying it's quite the same in all situations, but in many, uh, as I said before, I think doing research often doesn't help us solve the problem. So I, I think for any student who's up and coming and wanting to get into this sort of area, um, I, I would always say the golden rule is never become part of the problem. So how does one stop becoming part of the problem, especially when you're a chief scientific advisor, sort of embedded within a department uh, where there are all sorts of pressures on you, pulling you in particular directions? Well, I think it's to be able to stand up and give talks like this, to be honest, to be analytical about oneself, back in on what one is doing, and to be able to uh, be self-critical. 
But I think overall, scientists need to be um, more self-critical. But there are some common misconceptions about how government works as well. And, and certainly, I, pr I suppose that before I came into government, I shared some of these misconceptions. So I've provided some general quotations here, but they are, they are just simply general and not, not, not brought from any specific um, uh, publication or anything like that, but they are the kind of things that I hear and have read. For example, politicians don't, do not use science and ignore the evidence. My experience, and I have worked with uh, eight different politicians in the two years that I have been in the job, um, my experience is that they do use science, they do want to use science, and they try not to ignore the evidence. They genuinely, and I, there's not a single one of those politicians I would point to and say, they do not want to use the science or they do not want to listen. They do want to listen. But they are in a very difficult situation often and they have to make uh, decisions that are not entirely based on science because uh, you can integrate economics, politics, cost-benefit analysis, all those sorts of things into the decision-making process, um, which is not necessarily, and which can come up with a solution that's not necessarily science-based. Uh, government only uses the science that supports its case. In other words, they cherry-pick. Well, I, I guess that that's always a, always a problem, but again, my experience is that government is actually tends to be um, bend over backwards to try to use evidence in a balanced way uh, when in fact a lot of the critics and a lot of the stakeholders who they are having to cope with are very much cherry picking the evidence and one of the reasons why government can't afford to cherry pick is because of things like um, FOI, freedom of information uh, or judicial review uh, because under judicial review everything anybody ever writes about a subject is going to be in the public domain in some way or other. So the, 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 the level of scrutiny of what happened unprecedented, and for that reason, the behaviours you get within government are extraordinarily cautious with respect to how evidence is used. And uh, I think most people in government would, would rail at the idea that there's cherry-picking of evidence. Obviously, there's, a, there's a, a waiting process has to be done with uh, scientific evidence. Uh, and of course, their value judgments have to be made. Uh, and uh, it's perfectly possible for partic particular individuals to point a finger and say that cherry picking has happened under those circumstances. But my view is that um, it's, it's something that government tries to avoid. Uh, independent scientists are not listened to. Actually, that's not true. Uh, they are listened to. Uh, uh, and sometimes they, 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 they do have very significant effects. Um, independent scientists are independent. Um, I, I hear that a lot of the time. Actually, I don't believe there is uh, such a thing as an independent scientist. Everybody has an agenda one way or another. Some are a little bit more harder in one direction than another. Some are quite centrally placed, but everybody, whether they like it or not, has prejudice. Uh, and one has to understand that. And one has to also understand that from a polit politician's point of view, they are coming from a background of prejudice. They are professional, professionals at prejudice. That's what they do. And they, they see that in everybody else. So if a scientist like me is advising uh, a, a, a politician, that politician is seeing me through a lens of prejudice. Uh, his own prejudice, but he's also seeing He's, he's asking, or she, uh, is asking the question, what is my prejudice, or what is this scientist's prejudice? Uh, government is league with big business. Again, I see no evidence for that at all. I think the government tries very hard to take a balanced view and to, uh, uh, to, to consult with all the stakeholders involved. And again, going back to my, uh, the issue about the cherry picking of evidence, where there is in, in, immense public scrutiny um, of what government does. Um, there is no way that government would get away with being in league with big business, to be honest. Um, it's all the government's fault and the government is responsible. 
Um, I, I, that's a common um, uh, issue, that's a common uh, uh, cry. It's not necessarily one that comes from scientists, uh, but the reality is that um, government actually has very few strings to pull a lot of the time. Um, it, it can make laws, it can cajole, it can encourage, it can provide incentives, but actually its capacity for manoeuvre is incredibly limited. Uh, and uh, I, th I think that the, the public often think that politicians can make decisions across a huge decision space. Actually, the decision space they have is extraordinarily narrow. And, and it's usually very constrained politically uh, as well. And one has to understand that in order to be able to provide advice that's, that's useful. Um, it's been peer-reviewed and published, so it must be right. Uh, the number of times I've heard that, and it, that's absolutely not true. There is an immense amount in the scientific literature that is frankly just rubbish. And, the, and, the, and one of the biggest problems I have as a chief scientific advisor is working in areas where I don't have specific deep expertise and being able to filter the rubbish from the good stuff. And I could point to the whole area of pesticides as being an area where there is an immense amount of rubbish in the literature. But there'll be a few gold nuggets there that really are telling us the right story, and I've got to try and find those. But the, uh, the reference points to try and find those are few and far between. They're really difficult to find. Um, science, including economics and social science, is a firm foundation for policy making. Not true. I've already said that science and, and all the other things that go with it can sometimes actually get in the way of good policy making because sometimes the problem is not about information and the validity of information, it's about how people are able to align themselves to a particular set of values or judgments. And that is a political and social process, it's not one that can be very well informed by science. Um, so, uh, what is kind of my job description? In other words, what do I actually do? Well, here's, um, uh, here's a set of what I would call operational priorities for somebody like me. Um, risk management is important. I actually am responsible for um, all of uh, uh, or developing the uh, the knowledge base and the capabilities underlying all of DEFRA's risks. And for those of you who know about DEFRA, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, environment, the number of risks we have are enormous. I've mentioned pesticides, but there's an immense amount, um, uh, immense number of risks sitting there, uh, many of which rely on the biosecurity space, but we also have food security risks as well. Um, and knowing about those risks, understanding them, and making sure that a department like the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs is up to managing them is part of my responsibility. So we don't want to take, we want to know what the risk is of making bad decisions, and uh, as I've said here, there are sometimes long time lags in that. So we can make decisions now, and uh, the negativity of them might not be uh, felt for another 10 years or so. Um, so, you know, we can license a pesticide now that could be absolutely awful, but it takes 10 years for us to find out that actually it's really not, it wasn't a good idea. Um, modeling alternative futures. In other words, trying to ensure that we have a, 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 a basis upon which to make uh, uh, rational decisions about what the future might look like. Um, so that's about horizon scanning. Um, and horizon scanning is a really difficult thing to do well, but uh, nevertheless, it's something we have to try to do. Um, in the introduction, mention was made of uncertainties. We need to be able to understand what our uncertainties are uh, and understand them in the context of the epistemic and aleatory risks, in other words, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. I don't make myself at all popular in DEFRA when I put my hand up and say in front of ministers, ah, but have you thought of the unknown unknown? You know, that's, for politicians, that's a really hard thing to deal with. Um, and, the, and they 
frankly, they don't like it because, because what they want is certainty. They really want a certainty. And in science, we often deliver a lot of uncertainty. Now, you know, I think you could argue that it's very important, in fact, I would argue that it's very important that we are totally honest about the uncertainty there is in the information we give. Uh, but we have to understand that the person listening to that doesn't like to hear that. Um, now, giving hard messages is not something you should shy away from, but it's how you give those messages that's important. Uh, another part of my job description is describing the cost-benefit trade-offs of di making, making different decisions so that we can make better decisions. This is, where the, this is really the economist territory. I'm not an economist, but I do, I do understand cost-benefit trade-offs in the biological world because I actually studied that in, uh, in marine mammals, of all things. Um, and these animals are making decisions all the time which are based on, uh, on information that is coming in and they are basically cost-benefit trade-offs. Uh, and we have to be better at making those decisions ourselves. And we have to understand the payoffs associated with that and um, we also have to have objective measurement about how we're doing. In other words, we need to evaluate the kind of uh, uh, policy decisions we've made and be absolutely brutally honest about whether we are uh, being, uh, we're making good decisions or not. I also have responsibility for organizing evidence delivery into DEFRA, uh, and that's, I've already mentioned the problems about the quality of the literature, it's about quality control, uh, it's about managing our knowledge. And then the thing that excites me more than anything else, right down at the bottom of the screen here, is stimulating innovation. In other words, using the funding that we have to stimulate the academic community to come up with new ideas that will solve problems for us. Um, so what are the constraints on people like me? Well, uh, we often have a lot of very complex ideas. I mean, I think th things that we think of as being relatively simple in the academic community to non-academics can uh, appear just a complete maze of complexity. Um, so we have to get better at trying to communicate complex ideas. Um, we also need to understand that there are limits to the evidence uh, that we have. And there's this thing that I call, well, many people call multiple causation. Multiple causation, particularly in environmental science, is a real limit to what we can and cannot do and say. And we have to also understand that the receptors, the people who are listening, are desperate for a single cause-effect relationship. They love to be able to say, I have a problem, here's the, the cause of that problem, let's shut down that cause, and the problem goes away. Now, in environmental science, that almost is always, it's almost always never the case. We're dealing with multiple causation, uh, sometimes not just two causes, but, but many, many different causes can be, uh, uh, can be involved. And managing that is about systems management. It's not about simple cause-effect management. Um, I've said, mentioned media inadequacies here. Um, uh, I think the media has real problems translating what the scientific community says into messages for the public. And there are, there are reasons for that. I think that there are not enough scientists who are actually in the media, embedded in the media, who have come from a research background. Um, uh, I think we have some very good science journalists, but I think we have some very bad science journalists as well. Uh, and, and there's also a, an issue about the media obviously wanting to sensationalise, wanting to polarise views as well, which, uh, which doesn't help. Uh, science professionalism, this comes back to the issues about making sure that when we do produce information that it's robust, um, and sometimes that is not the case. Uh, and we also have problems around pseudoscience. I think that in some professions, um, if you're a practicing lawyer or a practicing medic, uh, you could be pretty well uh, sort of classified into those professions. Scientists are, there's a huge range of different scientists and a huge range of qualifications and things like that. And I, I think at the low end of the scientific spectrum, we get a lot of what I would call pseudoscience sitting in there. Uh, which doesn't help because it's very hard for the public 
politicians, bureaucrats, to differentiate between the pseudoscience and the good hard science that's there. The other, uh, another major constraint I have is, is just institutional inertia. You know, managing big institutions and making them change. Um, you know, if, if I had total control over everything that happened in DEFRA, we could change things really quickly. You know, it would be wonderful, but it just doesn't happen like that. There is massive institutional inertia, and it's not just in government. I've worked with the oil and gas industry. The oil and gas companies are the same. Deepwater Horizon was a, a, a manifestation of institutional inertia uh, in, in BP, uh, and we know that. Um, so, you know, institutional inertia is a problem because it can actually lead to institutional failure um, uh, or, or major failures in, in some ways. Market failure is a problem for people like me because what I mean by market failure, well, I mean that actually I need evidence for certain areas and I can try and look in the marketplace for that evidence, in other words, around all universities, etc., and there is nobody there to supply it. Um, and actually that is a major problem. It's one reason why DEFRA has spun up over many decades a lot of its own institutions because it needs, it needs to be supplied with certain types of science and research and actually there's nobody else there to do it so DEFRA has to, has to do that itself. That may be changing. Uh, time scales are also constrained, something I call a 20 year rule. The people who are looking at some new, great new idea on the laboratory bench now, it's going to take 20 years before it will be out there in being used properly uh, in an operational context. We've got to try and uh, collapse that downwards, that, uh, that time scale downwards, but if anything, it's getting longer because we put more barriers in the way to people getting new ideas out, whether it's through intellectual property barriers or whether it's through licensing and regulation barriers, it's just getting longer and longer and longer. So we need to try to collapse that, that time scale down a bit. Um, we also have the, 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 the interesting problem of um, uh, contrasting values applied to short and long, long time gains and uh, time scales. And, um, the, one of the issues I've had to deal with is forest health, for example, um, and forest health, uh, you know, we can do things now, but we won't see the results of it for another 50 years or so. Um, so just to look at the, 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 the bottom uh, left here, can we, can we persuade people to make decisions now when the payoff is several decades away? That's one of the biggest problems that the politicians face, um, because especially in environmental sciences uh, or in the environmental issues, the, 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 uh, the payoff is not going to be for a long time down the road. And actually it was Machiavelli who had recognised this in his treatise in 1513. Uh, so it's not new, uh, but it's a problem that is still with us. Um, I've mentioned regulation as a constraint there as well. Uh, I won't go into that any further. Um, let's see, I'm going to flick through this quite quickly. Structures to support uh, exchange, making science count in government. This is an article I wrote uh, um, last year. Uh, got uh, very severely criticised by uh, George Monbiot, uh, who compared me with J Kim Jong-il and Vladimir Putin for saying some of the things that I said. Um, uh, I think, I, I know he misunderstood me. Um, uh, I was saying that scientists are more effective at communicating with the decision-making process if they use the systems that are in place to do that rather than sort of getting into the media and creating a big storm. Um, he interpreted that as me wanting to shut scientists up. That's absolutely not the case. You know, we need more scientists speaking out, but, the, those, but scientists who speak out must understand their audience and how to connect with that audience in a way that is constructive. Um, and, and that's the point I was trying to make and that I think George Monbiot managed to miss, although I, I suspect he, he did understand it, really. Um, okay, so what are the problems with sort of the... Actually, I'm going to move on, move on from this because um, I'm, I'm sort of running out of, running out of time here. Um, I've also already mentioned the quality of evidence. Um, what are the structures that are in place in order to make this happen? Well, I can only speak about DEFRA uh, and say that what I'm 
doing is, is running a very strong agenda about making sure we have a, a, a robust science advisory structure that feeds into uh, ministers and into policy. And if you like, I see DEFRA as being uh, a bit like a building with a whole lot of uh, external uh, fire escapes on it and uh, sitting on those fire escapes are all the, uh, the science and the science advisory structure feeding into each part of, of the building. Um, so in DEFRA we have in the order of, uh, depending on how you define them, between 30 and 50 science, science advisory committees that um, uh, provide advice to different parts of the, uh, uh, of the policy structure. And at the top of that we have the Science Advisory Council, uh, which mainly feeds in through me to ministers. But under, underneath that, we have statutory committees, like the Advisory Committee on Pesticides, the Advisory Committee on Releases to the Environment, uh, uh, the Advisory Committee on um, Air Quality, for example, um, all of which provide us with independent and as robust as they can get at scientific ad advice. We also set up ad hoc advisory committees when we have new problems that arise. For example, I set up one recently on pollinators, which uh, has, has helped us greatly uh, develop our new uh, pollinator strategy. So we need, uh, we need to have a science advisory structure that is integrated into policy, that's transparent, and it's accountable. We have that, and there is in the order of two to 300 scientists at any one time involved in this advisory process. So to say that science is not used in government is completely wrong. And I think you could probably speak to many of the individuals on these committees and, uh, and get, that, uh, get a, a, a clear view from them about that. Uh, we also have other structures to support science and policy and things like the IPCC, um, something called the IPBES, which is just being developed. It's a sort of IPCC look-alike, but it's on biodiversity and ecosystem services. So it's the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And for many years, we've used something called the International Com um, uh, uh, Committee for the Exploration of the Seas, ICs, uh, to provide our fish stock assessments, for example. Um, so these are in international, uh, independent scientific bodies that are providing advice uh, into the scientific, into the policy system. Uh, just briefly, understanding the audience. Um, when the IPCC report was produced recently, um, I had a number of people uh, in the climate change community, FRSs and others, writing to me about the attitudes that Owen Paterson, my Secretary of State, had towards climate change. He's a climate skeptic. He's completely clear about that. Um, I advise him differently, but he chooses to take a different view, and that's fair enough. Um, those individuals who wanted to change his view thought that if I set up a meeting with them and they could explain to, that, to him what the information was on climate change, he would change his mind. Um, I, I think that's utterly naive, and it came from some very senior individuals. I think it's very naive. We have to see politicians as a window through which we see a much wider scientific, uh, or a much wider um, uh, 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 section of the public. They are representative of um, a particular constituency, and in, in the climate change skeptic constituency, I think is probably growing, um, I, I would regret to say. Um, I think we as scientists have to, have to understand that just speaking to the politicians is not what we need to do. We need to speak to the public because the politicians will be responsive to the public. The other thing is that we're, we're, we're pretty um, bad at uh, delivering positive messages. Um, we've got to find ways of um, getting the message over that is not all negative, all bad, and certainly in environmental sciences, there are some real challenges there, but we need to provide the public with short-term positive news on the things that are going well as well. Um, so scientists often make mistakes about the audience. I've just mentioned about uh, you know, the idea that speaking to politicians is what we want to do. Actually, we need to speak to the public. Um, I've already mentioned that we try to 
deliver messages that are far too complicated. We need to simplify the message, even, even at the cost of getting it not quite right. It's better to get the right message over than to get all the detail over. The other thing is that we've got to try to think about solutions rather than problems more, especially in the environmental sciences, where, you know, as, as I said, there are big problems, uh, but we need to be able to provide short-term solutions so that, that people can take positive messages from, from what's happening. Um, we, also, we often also, in science, I think, have a misunderstanding about how to communicate, and we need to get more strategic about how we structure our communication. And this is where the, the scientific societies, the Royal Society, the Society for Biology, uh, and various other societies can actually uh, start to help, um, where they can have a much more structured communication, uh, set of communications with policymakers. And I think the Royal Society is beginning that, certainly with climate change, uh, but it's a bit late. Uh, and we completely got it wrong with GM. You know, that was, that's a, a classic case of getting it totally wrong, and we're beginning to get our act in order with that one. But as I said at the bottom here, we've got a lot of evidence that says that science just doesn't get its messages over very well. We're having low uptake of science in schools, and science, I think, is being culturally isolated within the community as well. So here's four examples, very quickly at the end, on the use or not of evidence, where evidence has helped. First one, the most positive of all of them, uh, UK National Ecosystem Assessment and Natural Capital. So following on from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, DEFRA set up a UK National Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which has looked at a sort of high level economic assessment of the cost benefits of different policy trade-offs for the structure and function of the countryside, essentially. Um, what it has shown very clearly is that we have a capacity to make better choices about how we use the countryside. There is no doubt about that at all. Um, we sometimes think of major infrastructure projects as, 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 uh, as just pouring concrete, like building things like the high-speed railway, the HS2 from Birmingham to London, major infrastructure project. Uh, we're involved in a major infrastructure project in London, the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which is the new sewer, basically, underneath London. Um, but actually, major infrastructure could be uh, about natural capital. It could be about planting, about increasing the, the coverage of forest in the UK from 12% to 25%. And what we show through this is that actually the cost-benefit trade-off is positive. And it's not just positive, it's, it's at least as good as building a high-speed railway. So we've got to change the culture, but this is about science and evidence leading the policy. And what this has done is led to the, natural, the creation of the Natural Capital Committee, and there is genuine engagement in government and in Treasury now <coughs> about changing the national counts to account for the depletion of natural capital. Uh, and what, what I mean by natural capital, well, I, as mentioned, forests, but we've also got uh, coal reserves, etc., etc. There's lots and lots of different items of natural capital. So the national accounts may well change. It's not going to happen quickly, but again, uh, it might change. So that's, that's a real success story of uh, science leading policy. Bovine tuberculosis. This is an area where science really can't help very much. It's a socio-political problem. Of course, what science has done and will continue to do is provide the underpinning evidence for, let's say, TB incidence rate, um, genetic relationships between different uh, strains of TB, TB trans trans transmission routes, these sorts of things. But it cannot provide the solution to uh, solving the problem of bovine tuberculosis. And it's an increasing problem. Um, this graph shows that we got the problem under control and uh, through the 1990s we let it go again and uh, now we're having real trouble getting it, uh, getting it under control. Um, a positive story, tree disease. 
I could say tree and plant disease, but tree disease is the focus for this particular slide. Ash dieback was something that we had a, a big problem with. For those of you not from the UK, uh, it was the, when I came into post, it was the first crisis I had to deal with, was that uh, we had a, a pathogen uh, came into the country that is, is, that is killing most of our ash trees, and, and, and ash trees are a major part of our natural woodland system. Um, the graph below here see, shows the introduction of pathogens, new pathogens, tree pathogens to the UK, damaging tree pathogens to the UK. The drivers behind this are international trade. There is no doubt about that at all. We don't need any more evidence. But science has the capacity to, first of all, help us identify ways of shutting down the transmission of these pathogens, but also providing mitigating solutions um, to under, through understanding the pathogenicity, pathogenicity of organisms and coming up with mitigating procedures, usually using um, uh, uh, genetic methodologies. So that's an area where I think science uh, has helped and will continue to help. The final area where I think science um, hasn't helped but could help in future is on the issue around pollinators. There's been a lot of controversy around pollinators. Um, uh, some numbers banded around in terms of what they bring in value to us. Um, I think those numbers are probably pretty shaky. Uh, but science has not actually delivered us the fundamental information that we need in order to be able to make decisions. In other words, we don't even know if there's a decline in pollinators, to be absolutely frank. We don't know if there's a problem. We listen to people who say there's a problem, and actually I think they're probably right. There probably is a problem there, but the science, scientific community has not provided us with the basic information that we need in order to be able to make uh, well-structured decisions. So the only decision we come up, come up with is a strategy, the first item of which is we need to do some research. Um, but this feeds back into how we then respond to things like neonicotinoid pesticides, which uh, have been a major issue, uh, certainly in my tenure, and uh, uh, whether we want to ban these pesticides or not. But the, because, because many people say that these pesticides are a cause of the decline in pollinators when in fact we don't have evidence of a decline in pollinators at all. So should we as the government ban neonicotinoid pesticides? Well the scientific community has done a whole lot of experiments around them but in many of those experiments they've overdosed the animals, they've, they've given an insecticide to an insect the insects have not felt very well as a result of that which is not really very surprising. Um, so the, the scientific community, again, has not really asked the right questions, which, is, which are, uh, are the kind of questions which the policymakers need to be asked, which is, if you give field realistic doses of uh, neonicotinoid pesticides to things like bees, do you get population level effects um, of that pesticide? And there isn't a single experiment, I think, that's been done in the world to date that has properly addressed that question. Uh, despite the fact an immense amount of money and effort has gone into studying the neonicotinoid pesticides. And again, it comes back to this issue about single causation. People think that's the, that's the problem with pollinators. In other words, if we get rid of neonicotinoid pesticides, everything will be fine. It won't be because the problem with pollinators, if there is a problem, is probably landscape scale. We've designed our landscape around a, an agricultural system that is probably not very good for pollinators, to be absolutely honest. So up to a point, the neonicotinoid issue is a displacement activity for the real costs associated with uh, the changes that might need to be made in order to make sure that pollinator populations are uh, sustained. So with that, I'll finish and thank you very much for your uh, attention. And I hope that what I've said has sparked a few, um, few controversies around the room. And I'd be happy to take any questions if you want. Thank you very much, Brian. Professor Pollock, I think uh, I see many hands going up. But we are running behind, so I would say we, we just have time for maybe two questions. Um, maybe one from this side of the room and one from this side of the room. Cheers.
I, I, I really do apologize for going on longer than I should have done. I think we should apologize. have about five minutes or right. so, but the okay. problem is we have to be out of, uh, after lunch, I th uh, before lunch at a certain time. So okay. Yeah. So same as yesterday, uh, if you could say your name and speak into the microphone, and we will be collecting both questions and then you get a chance to reply. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Sheila Jasner from Harvard University. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for a wonderful talk and uh, uh, for saying hardly anything that I disagreed with. Uh, and uh, Great. That, that leads me to the question, because uh, if the position that people like you represent, I mean, I, I said to my friend Roger Peelke here that if John Holdren would learn to talk like you, America would be a different place. So in that sense, in that sense, I do mean what I'm saying. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's a curious way in which your entire talk seems to slide over the frictions and complexities that I see in Britain as somebody observing from the outside. So I was struck that the kinds of complaints that I see represented by the public are not necessarily the ones that you're extremely thoughtful an agreeable talk is addressing. One of them is uh, about uh, not that scientists should make their messages clearer to the public, but how do scientists learn to hear the messages from the public in, that are being quite clearly expressed? And how does one deal with the fact that on GM, which you mentioned, and nuclear power, uh, there's a strong, strong sense in parts of the British public that government has already made decisions and that the position is how to sell those decisions to the public and not hear the, uh, the messages coming back in the other direction in a way that truly looks at the alternatives. So that's one set of uh, challenges that I didn't hear addressed in the talk. The other one is what about Britain in the world? You mentioned the IPCC, but a lot of the time you were talking about the public and I'd be very curious to hear what somebody in your position thinks about the public when we're talking about issues, even the bee dieback, I mean, the, and you mentioned ash. Uh, I mean, these are international global, the problems of globalization. So I'm wondering, you know, how somebody in your position thinks about the challenges of communicating and bringing publics along when willy-nilly Britain is embedded in a global network of threats and dangers to the environment. Thank you. Um, Tim Johnson from Harriet Watt. Um, you described a situation where you were doing research on the Northern Pacific and you explained that you were a disinterested party and I took that to mean disinterested in the political debate. A couple of slides later you claimed that there's no such thing as an independent scientist and I wondered if as a younger researcher you associated being disinterested in politics with being independent, and perhaps the problem was that you can't really make that association. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so should I have a go at those? Um, listening to the public, um, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think that, that, is, that is something I think that is, is done a lot in government, but it's, it's often done through the representative organizations and stakeholder groups and things like that. Um, uh, obviously, they have particular points of view and particular constituencies that they represent. Um, but there is a concept that we try to pursue called open policy making, which is basically about saying, here's a problem and giving that problem to the representative stakeholder community and saying, actually, you come up with policy solutions to that and we'll implement them. Obviously, there's a dialogue goes on there. Um, one, of the, one of the examples, the current examples of that is, is in the UK is marine conservation zones. Now, many people over the last few years will have seen a lot of controversy around marine conservation zones but open policy making doesn't stop controversy, but it does actually stimulate a constructive 
um, uh, argument, public argument, about how to do things. Sometimes that argument can get quite heated, but I think what we've seen with developing the concept of marine conservation zones in the UK is a capacity through open policy making to allow that argument to come to a conclusion and to move us on. And I think that we are in that, we're on that journey at the moment. Um, you mentioned GM and nuclear. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose in, in both of those areas, at the end of the day, you have an elected government that has to make decisions in the national interest. Uh, certainly with nuclear, uh, there, there are, I think there are some really hard decisions that politicians have to make uh, in the national interest. Uh, and sometimes they will move out of, let's say, the consultation mode and just say, actually, and it comes back to this issue about people making sacrifices now when the payoff isn't going to be for 20 or 30 years, uh, with things problem that politicians or decision makers are having to deal with, uh, they have to represent the overall interests of the public. Um, and it's not an easy one. Uh, with GM, I, I actually think that, um, I, you know, I, there's been so much said about GM. Um, the, the, the arguments that are coming currently from politicians um, are actually quite nuanced in the sense that they're, they're not saying GM is the, is the thing for the future. It's just one of the tools that we have available to us. But sometimes that message is not received in the way that politicians would like, because simple messages are often what the public will hear, not the more complicated message. But I think that it, as so long as the politicians um, keep up the, if you like, the broad rhetoric around um, GM is just one component, then I think it will eventually get picked up. Um, but the reality is that um, although I think there is a lot of listening going on, at some point politicians sometimes have to make those decisions. Um, and, and that's in public interest. Um, Globalisation was, was your next point. Um, yeah, I mean, the UK is only a very small player in a lot of these things, absolutely. And, you know, when you see the UK embedded within the European uh, Union structure as well, with respect to, let's say, animal and plant health, particularly plant health, we have very few strings to pull to stop the import of, um, of diseases, pests and diseases from within the European structure because we have a free trade uh, agreement. Uh, and that's just one example of the kind of challenge that a country like the UK in a globalised system, and it's only going to get more of a challenge in the future. How we work with that? Well, we, we, we try to be leaders in that, and this is where science can actually play a big role. Having a high quality leading science community can lead the agenda on international issues. Um, finally, uh, the issue around, um, yes, whether, uh, you know, in my example, I did have a conflict of interest sitting there. Of course, yes, uh, I did. And I suppose I went through the learning process of understanding that um, suddenly I was getting into drawn, some, drawn into something here uh, because of the, the approach I had taken. And I was, um, I, I, I wanted to walk the tightrope or the knife edge, which was between both of the warring parties. You know, that was my ideal. But it is a tightrope and it's a, or a knife edge, and you can very easily fall off one side or the other. And um, I was falling off on one side, so I decided to get out. Um, but, but the reason I fell off on one side was probably because of embedded prejudice. And, and so you learn about your own embedded prejudices. I don't know if that helps. OK, I think uh, we'll, we'll, is it, we'll have to leave it here in the interest of you've time. You've got to know how to control it uh, I and recognize we, we it. Should thank our speaker again for this very insightful talk. <laughs>